Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mananai Sengsuan. I'm a software developer from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I'm here to present you the uh, topic of analyzing spam mails in Twitter user network. The motivation are the following. Uh, first of all, spam irritate user. When Twitter user see spam, they often uh, not pleased with the spam. So normally they want, don't want to see the spam. So if we could identify spammers, we could block those accounts and we could get rid of all the spams. And uh, the third reason is that it's a good ML and network analysis exercise anyway. Uh, there are four steps to do the analysis. First of all is to collect Twitter data. The second step is to implement a spam classifier so that the computer software can know which tweet is a spam, which is not a spam. The third step is to import all the data that we have collected to the graph database, which is the Neo4j database. And the last step is to analyze the data. The second, the third and the fourth step would be done in Python notebook, which I will show you later. The first step is to collect the Twitter data from the real Twitter network. There are already a few resources that cover this topic. So I list you the, the information that you can take a look. The first one is from a book and the second one and the third one are from my articles in the towards data side. Uh, I will talk a little bit about how I did collect the Twitter data. The first step is to identify 50 popular trends or hashtags in the Twitter network at the moment. And for each trend, we will search for the tweet of that uh, keyword. And the third step is that for each tweet, we identify who writes or retweet it. So we get the user from uh, the tweet for each tweet. And the last one is to identify all the fans of the user who, who wrote or retweet. Uh, the data that we collect from Twitter uh, the first one is the status, which uh, we call status in Twitter API, but normal, normally people call tweet. The second one is the user, the user object that wrote or retweet. And uh, the third one is the user and friend relationship. Uh, next, we will need to label the status that whether each status is a spam or not. Because we need this label status in order to fit into the classifier later on. And all the data that uh, I mentioned are in CSV format, which will be imported into graph database. Okay. The second step is the spam classification. Okay, what we need is uh, the first one is the label tweet file, which is the CSV file that contain all the tweet that we collect. In addition, in addition to the, the text, we need to 
classify that whether each tweet is a spam or not. The second one is the unlabeled tweet, unlabeled CSV file, which our classifier will predict on this data and we will use output. The classification step. Uh, the first, first step is to read the training tweet data file or CSV file into the uh, Panda data frame. And the second one is to convert into feature, ve feature vectors using TFID vectorizer. The third step is to submit data into training and testing. And the next one is to use base as a classifier. Next one is to fit the classifier with the training data. The next step is to running the class, run the classifier with the real data that we would like to use later on. Okay. Let me show you the code. Okay, I have the notebook, Python notebook here. This notebook will do the spam classification. Uh, I will uh, quickly uh, show you the code. Uh, first one is the import statement, it's nothing. Okay, the, this one is the uh, training data. As I told you, it's a CSV file that we are prepared. Uh, we load the training data into the Panda data frame. Take a look at the how many of the, the data we have. Uh, we run group by statement and count. So we have two class. Uh, label equal to one means it's a spam. So we have like 357 spam to it. And for the zero label mean the non-spam or ham. So we have like almost 10,000 tweets with uh, not a spam. Let me show you simple uh, spam tweet. Just print the sample spam. Yeah, uh, they are in Thai language so uh, most of them are like uh, recruit people to work online or try to sell something, something like that. The next one is to load the NLP because we need to analyze the, the text data and the text data here is in Thai language. So we need Thai NLP. So we have Pi Thai NLP to do the Tasks. We import the Thai NLP and then uh, the next one is to extract top hashtag from all the tweets from the training data. The next one is to uh, write the code to tokenize Thai string into word. Yes, the code. And the important one is the TFID vectorizer. We need to convert all the text in the training data into feature vector so that the machine learning code can process them. So we use TFID vectorizer from SKLearn to do the job. And we supply it with the stop word, which is a Thai stop word. And we provide the vectorizer with the tokenizer that uh, I have brought a little bit earlier. Okay, and we transform the data into the feature. Yes, the result. Uh, the result has like 10,000 row and 6,000 uh, 
uh, feature. The next one is to uh, load the classifier. We will use a native based classifier. Next one is to split the training feature into a train and test data set so that when we train, we can verify that our classifier is good enough. Okay. Here we have a base classifier and fit with the training data. And after we fit it, we predict by using the test data. And we uh, check the result by using uh, score, accuracy score, precision recall, and ROC, AUC. Uh, the result is promising because precision is like 90%, recall is like 96%. Next one is the uh, we use the classifier with the real real data here. We load the real data and we use the classifier to predict. So take a look at the result. Uh, we have like uh, almost sixty thousand tweets, and we identify about two hundred and forty-eight spam tweets in our uh, production data and we save the data into the csv file okay. the second step is to import data into the Graph database. Uh, we have a uh, user file, user underscore friend file, and status file that we need to import into the new 4K database. So we copy the three files into import degree and we run import command load CSV. And after that, we run cipher command in order to uh, make relationship between. Uh, or the entity or, or the node. Let me show you the code. Uh, the next one is the import code. Uh, before we import, we created two constraints to make sure that thing uh, work properly. The first one is to make sure that user ID is unique. And the second one is to make sure that status ID is unique. So we create two constraints. Uh, the next one is to uh, import CSV file into the graph database. Uh, the import command is here. Oh, hi, Manana. Use, Sorry to interrupt uh, you. Load in CSV between. command. And the file is the file in the import degree. And we do this in Python notebook. And we import uh, 1.5 million user. Next is to import user friend relationship. So we have another CSV file, user friend in the import degree. And we use uh, load CSV to import the relationship. When, uh, Hi, Manan, I, uh, sorry yes. to interrupt you in between. Uh, we uh -huh. need to wrap it up in the next uh, one or two minutes. Oh, OK, sorry. Sorry. Uh, OK, OK. So we load uh, user friend. And the last one is we load status. OK. Okay, after import the data, here is the schema. So we have user status and spam. Uh, the last part is the network analysis part. So we will do visualization 
Parenko Analysis and Community Detection. Uh, here's a notebook of the analysis. Uh, because of the time limit, so we, we go into the picture. I use the some cipher query here in order to show the spam spammer and use the NX visualization library in order to show the spammer. So from the, the picture here, you can see that all the spammer, or a lot of them are connected together, which means they are friends or they work together. The next one is the triangle analysis. Okay, so we have, uh, we will check whether we can identify more spammer by using triangle, but unfortunately, I cannot see any relationship. The last part is a community detection. Uh, I learned the Luen community detection in order to see uh, group and spammer in the group. Let's go to the the result. So here we have a lot of uh, community. Uh, the first one is like uh, 2,700 people in the in the group, and we have like almost 500 subscribers in the group. But this is only about 16 percent. The most important important one is this one. Uh, the group size is 300. Oh, sorry, sorry, this one. The group size is uh, almost 200. But we have like uh, 177 spammer in this group, 92%. So almost all spammer are in this group. We have I, some um, cipher theory uh, in order to check who are not spammer in the group and release that here. Yeah. Uh, Manana, sorry to break you again. Uh, we okay. are actually out of time now. I've already stressed okay. a bit. Uh, okay. Can we wrap this session quickly? Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, we we are okay. we are out of time. If do you have more slides to cover? Can we just do it in the next one minute if possible? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, what would I would like to say is that by using community data and uh, the algorithm we use now is Luwen Community Detection. So the Luwen Community Detection can detect uh, some spammer in the Twitter network. And one community have a lot of spammer. It's like 90% of the community is spammer, are spammer. And after we check the list that are not spammer, we can conclude that the rest are spammer also. Uh, conclusion here is that uh, spammer work together and community detection can identify more spammer that not initially detected. That's all. Uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you very I, much. I'm, I'm really sorry I had to cut you short. Uh, uh, we, are, we are really short on the timeline right now. Uh, but yes, uh, do stay by. And uh, there, there are folks who are asking for GitHub repo link in the chat window on Hopin. Okay. So I would request if you can share it over there after the session. Thank you. Thanks okay. once again. the very beginning, which occurred many years ago, to uh, enterprise uh, KPI and performance. So the very, uh, very few years ago, maybe uh, at least four years ago, I discovered on Twitter a storytelling about uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, the TV show was everywhere. People were talking about uh, Game of Thrones at the coffee, uh, coffee pose. 
and uh, I discovered this really amazing uh, story, data storytelling. And um, I really wanted to achieve this kind of things. I was really wondered and I wanted to, to be able to produce that kind of things just for fun. So in, in New Caledonia, there is a, a comic book and um, I, I decided to implement it uh, the same way I am Game of Thrones and see what, uh, what could happen. So uh, it's a paper book. So I had to modelize the data. I took inspiration from the Game of Thrones uh, storytelling, started to modelize characters and interaction between characters. Then uh, I had to collect data, which was a manual process, uh, switching pages and putting the data in my fingers on my laptop. Then prepare the data in, uh, in CSV, actually. Then starting to perform, perm, perform some analysis. Then produce a storytelling, discovering, mo discovering models. And uh, while pushing some analysis at this time uh, on Jiffy, I started to see emerge like kind of intelligence. In fact, uh, this time it was about sociology. And uh, this is a very important part in this adventure because it led to a lot of uh, other researches. To make short, here uh, the data says that kids talk between kids on the bottom on the left. And on the right side, there only are adults. So that was um, that was my very first discovery, and um, I want uh, I wanted to perform some other kind of discoveries because I really liked and enjoyed the feelings. Um, three years ago, when I came at uh, OPT New Caledonia, uh, I'm uh, I'm in a division where we have a lot of data coming from a lot of places, a lot of applications, a lot of workflows interacting e each others. And uh, some people in my division started to draw with a mark on paper. This kind of drawings you see on the right, it's the or original one, in fact. And people were coming in the office and asking us, would you know which connects to this and do that? And uh, I decided to, to pay great attention to this kind of drawing and uh, even performed some experiment, exp experimentations, which were uh, taking back the paper and see what people were doing. And people did strange things. They started to ask, where is my paper? Uh, who took my paper? I want it back. So that was very interesting as a manager. And I started this the following workflow, which is uh, still uh, in use today. I started to use uh, my team activities, then started to implement visual management, which is a key part in graph databases, then starting to challenge with, with question not only once uh, why, but why, 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 and finally you get you get the final answer, you get the, the real problem you have to solve. Then when you have a, a quite important amount of, uh, of questions, you have to sort them and score them, the most important one or the easiest one. You have to have cheese, achieve this kind of uh, management task, which can be led with the Lean method, or Agile or Scrum methods. And then when you answer this question, we have this catalog of questions, you see new opportunities coming to you at a very fast pace and not necessarily at a very high cost. So here is my, my fr the framework I use on a daily basis. First thing, we deliver software very fast and the right thing. So if we fail, we fail fast. With not a lot of loss of money nor time. Then we produce as a team. Uh, it's very important, uh, even if with people uh, with the remote working, we produce as a team and we use the right tool for that. Then uh, as developers, as software developers, we make a version of everything. We can go back in the past at any date we want. And then we deliver. We deliver at a very fast pace, very often, and we check the quality and we challenge how people react to what we are delivering. We answer questions. We are here to answer questions. And then this is a bit more the management part. You observe new habits because when people have new tools of new answers to their traditional questions, they change their habits and you have to take great care of that. Then if you are a lucky guy, you can see appropriation, which means you are in this, on this track to success. People use your tool and sometimes use your tool to make something else that you initially thought about. This is a great indicator of you are on the success and uh, deliver value at a regular pace, which means uh, we don't stay a month without delivering something. We deliver value on little increments weekly or sometimes daily. 
And finally, this is the holy grail. You impact the culture. This is really what you must achieve if you want to perform with many people. So there is a little, uh, little question for you. So I'm going to launch it now. According to you, which KPI drive your IT services? So if you go on menti.com uh, and put your, your code, uh, you, should, uh, you should see which uh, KPI are coming up. If you can go to it. I don't know if you can use it. I don't see people coming. Uh, I'm going to copy the link in the chat. Here we go. Oh, I maybe the technical issue. So maybe you could think about financial people. Uh, where do you live? These kind of things. And um, so I skip to our tools or stack, like we say in software development. First, we use paper and markers. For measure management, it's the best uh, best tools. Every uh, everyone can get these kind of tools. Then we use GitHub, GitHub.com, to store the data to make issues to store our code and our data. Then comes Neo4j. Then Bloom, NeoDash. And then more technical, Docker, Cypher, Python, Jupyter Notebooks, and G5. Ah, yes, the first results are coming. Excellent. So uh, this is actually very interesting. So I see uh, coming on the first uh, KPI, human, money, time, security, return on investment, and time. This is really an awesome feedback, and uh, we'll see later time. Yes, financial achieved goals, ticket resolution time. Oh, it, it looks good. New versus closed tickets. Yes, this is all about performances. People, human, are coming twice. This is really exciting. The main philosophy um, of my speech is that we have to achieve to see the, um, the enterprise as a whole thing. And that, like in nature, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And it's like a mantra, an everyday mantra, uh, which help keep us on the track. If you have things in pieces, you will lose performances, you will lose money, you won't be able to deliver the solutions you want to deliver at the right pace. So he is like a Maslow pyramid, uh, made by my, my, my one. So first, IQ, a um, lot of you have already said uh, in the, in the men Menti, there is a money. Without money, you can't have people working for you. This is why people and skills come just after the money. If you have people with no money, they won't work for you except on open source, but you won't, you won't necessarily be able to achieve the goals you have to achieve. Then, once you have money and people, you can develop your own services, which mean uh, websites, applications, uh, mobile apps, that kind of things. We are software engineering, and then we are coding a lot of things every day faster, and then we, ge we generate technical debt, which means uh, it works one day, but two years later, the look and feel is not the right one. We have security flow eventually, and uh, that kind of things. And then we come to the next step, the build and run. The build and run, for those who don't know what it is, when you build things, everyone loves to build things. I create something, I'm very happy with my new toy, but then uh, one year later, it can become very uh, um, a real hassle to maintain it up and running and secured. And then we achieve the top of the pyramid, which is the time to market. When you have an idea, you want it to get it on the next week, on the next month, and also next year, because if you deliver on the next year, other people will have made instead of you, and you have lost. And then you are lack of money, then you will lose people, you won't be able to run your services, and this is a bad 
very a bad trip. So this is the holism. And the holism relies in uh, IT management on a lot of data. We are data centric, we are data driven. So here on where we get all our data, I will show you in the next slide. First, our assets are applications. Applications are web services, mobile apps, uh, software as a service. Everything we rely on to manage our activities. Then, as an other service, we have github.com. I mean the API, because GitHub gives a lot of API to, to see what uh, what kind of code are we are we doing, how many how many people push code when, which kind of quality that kind of stack, how we using Java, Python, this kind uh, things are provided by API. We can say do the same kind of things on GitLab, which we are doing. Then we can use Sonar Cube for software quality, and you can see you have, we have actually a lot of API of data or data sources, like someone uh, some, sometimes end of life because uh, each software, each piece of software has an end of life, and you have to manage it. You have to monitor it if you don't go to don't want to have problems. Uh, also, we have some enterprise resources like Active Directory which is linked to people. You want to know uh, who, who is working for you. Also, skills and missions. Where are your skills? Where are the competencies? Are you, do you have the right people at the right place? And also, you can integrate with a lot of uh, third-party services like open data, localities, uh, graphic, graph, um, geographical information systems, um, financial services on Oracle, for example, or even scrap documents on SharePoint. There are other kinds of, of data, but this is what we can work on. Then the next step is to map all the organization as the whole thing, as the whole living thing, driven by the data itself. So here is how we can browse the data model of our enterprises. This is graphical. And uh, you can see that how, how things are integrating the one with the others. Then you can see that later you can drill down, uh, see uh, how people are connected to financial services, how technical debt uh, can be managed and that kind of things. As a manager, when you see that kind of things, I can tell you that it's a very exciting experience because you feel that finally you master your data. Then you can rely on grad data science, which is embedded. I won't make a, a full tutorial on which metrics we can rely on, but uh, mainly you will see how we use centrality, for example, and connectivity and that kind of things with visual management. Here we go. Our first um, topic is application centrality. So as you, can, as you can see, there is an application in the center. And what the, the current, the recurrent question we have, if I fail this, if I have issues on this application, which other application will fall? This is a crucial question and we have to be answered to answer it very fast and very, very, very efficiently. That was our first MVP on this modelization. Now it's time for the second, second test. I'll send you the menti. Here we go. Let's go. So you have to sort application criticity by domain. So is it the money? Are there the people? Is it geographic information system or document management, like invoices, that kind of things? Or the fact to know your customer. So once uh, you get some data, some IDs, and once you have finished your ranking, we'll see if the data is uh, matching your expectations. I make a little solution to keep in time, to keep in track. So first, oh, very interesting. Financial is coming first, 
then the customers, then human resources. Oh, human resource is coming second. Then customer, then document. Very interesting. So this is what you imagine. And what you see right now uh, on the presentation is what we got out of the data we, we currently have. So this is based on the calculus of centrality on the algorithm called PageRank. And the first uh, kind of software which is coming first is money, is a financial capital, because without financial capital, you can do anything, but this is told by the data itself. Then you have a second kind of capital, which you have ranked third, but which comes second in, uh, in our data, it's a social capital, it's the people, it's the skills, this kind, that kind of things. And then the surprise came that for the third, third position came the geese. And for telecommunication and postal services, finally it makes sense. Then come customer and prospects, which are linked to financial capital, then document management. This is very exciting and very satisfying to see that you, you can modelize and that the data bring you some form kind of truth. Then often in presentation, in, re, in uh, some meetings, people lot, make a lot of visio and uh, you have picture. But in information services, what you want is data. So a drawing is good, but our job is to provide data. So this is how we achieved our modelization. And uh, on the right side, you have a cloud environment running on Azure with power apps and that kind of things. And on the left side, on the yellow, it's on-premise. Items on the right side on blue are blue because we have an attribute telling that it's a SaaS services. And what we can say with data is that you have a single, puff, single point of failure here, here. You have to pay great atten attention to, that, to this link because if you lose it, you lose all the right part of the application and then you have a loss of services. So you have, it means you have to put efforts in putting high availability services on this side, driven by the data. This is what is really exciting. Then I also talked to you about people, skills, mission activities. So what we have achieved is that we could import through API calls referential of uh, skills, which is called CGREF in France, is dedicated to um, information services uh, skills. And we could import them on, uh, on our model. So here I am. I know that I am managed by a kind of some, some people, but for each people of my team, I could also see which skills they have. So you have a cartography and also a family of skills for example, here, I see that we have a lot of skills around project management. So I, make, I can make decisions. I can ask for more resources, for example, to manage project of more resources for software developer if I need to go faster. Then we can use what we call topology. Topology is a mathematical concept, which is in fact the science, the study of the space. But here, very simply, what we can see on the left is that topology, which is an abstract concept becomes a really important, very important uh, KPI. On the left side, you can see that you have two kinds of knowledges. You have two graphs that are disconnected. This is a lack of knowledge. Truly, clearly, you have two, two systems and you, can, you cannot connect them. So you lose information. This is not allism. On the right side, this is what we could achieve after some work on scrapping new kind of data, and then we could build a bridge between these two graphs. And then it means that you, we can generate more intelligence, more knowledge on each kind of nodes of the enterprise, from people to assets, to money, to everything you want to know. You can discover a lot of very exciting things and put uh, some KPI. For example, for those who know DevOps, DevOps is how operational sysadmins, uh, DBAs, are collaborating with software developers. And here, thanks to the data we've pulled from GitHub API, you can see that there are some codes exchanged between two kinds of teams. This is all generated by, by data. And in fact, this is sysadmins here and their reports all around. 
This is software developers and their repos. And you can see that some people have made contribution each other. So the, these two nodes is not, is not that bad. We can make uh, devops between these two entities, and but not with this one. Why is that? Should we improve that? Is it a risk? You have to, to make choices. And with that, you can perform this kind of analysis. And if someone tells you in your organization, are you doing DevOps? You can, yes, yes, but I have two, uh, two, two islands, two disconnected graphs. Centrality of applications. Sometimes you can see that you have clusters of uh, dom domain-driven clusters of applications. And sometimes you have an application which is between these two domains. So this means you have to put a lot of efforts to make this availability as big as possible. Then put maintenance resources and a lot of people to make sure this stays up as much as possible. As told earlier, uh, when you develop things also, uh, it's like uh, your car, you have to make some maintenance. And we could inject uh, some data about software end of life, which means past a certain date, you have to change your software because if you have a security flow, it won't be fixed. So you are in danger potentially. So we could create this Neo Dash dashboard. We can make available at a single place all your technical depths uh, KPIs. So you make you can share it with other teams and be able to invest on the right place. Sometimes technical depth may be acceptable in some places. Maybe Java it is not so so bad. But in some other places, you have to fix Angular because it's end of life and it won't be secured. Or it won't be able to offer an, an, um, an optimal experience, user experience. So very easily, as we can get the, the whole thing, you can attach technical depth to financials. So this is really exciting. And even you can find path between technical depth and financial cost. For example, do application with a maximum technical debt imply maximal cost? Where should you invest your money to avoid that kind of anti-patterns? And as you can see, it's as a service. You can see all metadata occurring when you drag a node, and uh, it's very comfortable. You don't have to make uh, to produce documentations as it's very easy to use. So that, this is a little focus. So it's all Cypher driven. So here you have the query. You have a, a radar chart here from uh, NeoDash. And you can browse interactively also. It's very comfortable in technical depth and apps. So uh, you can find some, detect some kind of segmentation by domain, by stack, and that kind of thing. For software engineers, it's very comfortable. As told before, you have to be able to link applications to financial costs. This, this has been achieved here on the node. You can see the application, which has here a GitLab repository. So here is the source code. And you have a Node.js uh, node. So you can see if you have technic technical depth. You can see who maintains your application. Eventually, you can also have a repository on GitHub. And this is the financial part. So this means the application, you have money to maintain this application. And how much did it cost to you? Each time you cost, you have nodes that tell you how much money you have put in it. This is very easy to interact with. And the query as a model is very easy to use. Cypher queries are also very, uh, very easy to design. So sometimes we change the paradigm and there are new metaphors coming out. So first, the questions are repackaged as data storytelling, which means when you have a large question, you will create a storytelling with maybe dedicated dashboards. We use the Bloom perspective to answer a specific question because they are very easy to implement and deliver. Also, we deliver domain-driven dashboards, which means, for example, for bunker services or postal services or for technical depth. Each question has a kind of perspective. Also, our cartography is version itself 
everything is done on uh, GitHub, so on Git, and we are implementing semantic release. So we can go back and forth and compare things in time. This is a rule story. We are working on this project since more than one more than a year. And here's uh, the movie of the code we have created with bots. Oh. Here we go. It's a bit lagging. Okay, so you can see on the top top left that we have a lot of CSV. Then at the time, Python scripts are coming because we we started to implement a lot of things with some markdown here. So you see growing the the, the set the number of C, of uh, Python files and CSV files. You can see some cipher coming, and Jupyter notebooks also coming because the data scientist has joined uh, our team recently. This is a whole story of uh, our database. The most, one of the most um, great achievements I could see as a manager was the rise of skills and cohesion. And the fun fact is that, in fact, you can score that because skills are, are part of the cartography itself. So we have a data engineering. We are using Kafka a lot, and uh, we are using a lot of third-party uh, API. We are performing integrations uh, with the thanks of Python. We have now data scientists we ma who make reporting analysis and give us feedbacks, for example, on model qualities. And we have developed also data storyteller skills on Jupyter, Bloom, uh, a lot of Bloom, uh, NeoDash, and a bit graphics here. And now we are working on generating uh, machine learning models to make links prediction, especially on uh, technical depth and uh, money. At the end, uh, one of the biggest success is to see that we could. Sorry. Um, we could impact the culture as we could embed uh, cartography right inside in documentation, like here in this example, Atlassian Confluence. I was not aware it was done, then I, I felt on that, so people uh, are using it in real life without necessarily telling you they use it, which is awesome. Um, what are the great questions, the biggest questions that matter? One of them is how did application centrality evolve in time? Sometimes you have little third-party projects um, that appear, and two years later, it becomes very central and business critic. Thanks to Git and Neo4j, we can see uh, the, how this application centrality is moving. At the beginning, it was peripheral, but then two years later, it's the center of the graph. So this is centrality. It's a very important metric. Then domain-driven clusters. I mean, is postal activities uh, linked to um, telecom activities, for example? How do they? Let's find out. Also, relation between departments. Are people really collaborating code or not, or between applications? Is contribution between source codes uh, linked to relation between applications? If not, maybe is it a risk? Maybe is it an anti-pattern? You have the data, you can make the choice, you can make the reporting. And some very easy metrics, very, uh, very easy, but impacting ones. High availability fibers. I mean, if you have high availability applications and that you have apps, apps that rely on it that are not high availability ones, you are at risk. So you have to, to make, so every HA app rely on the HA app. Personal data fibers and GDPR. So it means you have somewhere an application that has a lot of personal data, and you have another application that connects to the application, with, but which says, no, I'm not using application personal data. Is it really true? If not, why is this connection? You should pay attention and look further what's, what's with that. And then uh, the holy grail also, 
money <laughs> prediction between technical debt and financial cost. I mean, I mean variability. That's it. So the interesting part, the fun part, the fun conclusion of that is that at first we, we are just here to answer question to uh, which am I connecting to? Uh, we are looking for answers at first, but now we are looking for the best questions, the best challenging questions. And uh, that's my last slide. So if you have a question, you're welcome. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Adrian. Well, we do have a couple of questions in the chat window. Let me just take them one by one. The first question is, is there any algorithm used in this project? We used um, page ranking, eigenvectors, and also uh, the one link to uh, topology uh, with uh, how they detect link and nodes, the one with others. So uh, basically, it's a GDS uh, package, and also a lot of epoch too, because we needed to parse text and transform, perform transformation, and that kind of things. All right. The next one is: uh, Is it flexible for large data if using a graph model? Actually, yes. Uh, it's designed with, and we have started to use indexes. Because when you create uh, relations at a certain stage, you need to put indexes first to ensure that you have unique nodes, for example. And then when you make create new relationships, it can take a lot of time to, to, to create the relations itself. But for that part, it's like, it's like on relational databases. All right. And the next one is, how do we access graph databases in C++ programs? Oh, I guess uh, there, are, there are a lot of SDK for Neo4j. Uh, we are using um, the Python binding, the Java binding also, it's very cool. I think there is a Go binding, I guess. Yeah. But the community is, is really active, so it's very well documented. And also you can perform REST queries or GraphQL, which are not yet using, not yet. <laughs> All right, I think that's pretty much about it from the Q&A section of the chat window. Well, this was a really exciting session for me, at least. I'm sure it would have been same for the audience as well. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian, once again. Thank you for your time and look forward to having you for the next year as well. <laughs> have a great uh, end of day. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's a real pleasure to be here today. So thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I am going to walk you through uh, three demos uh, and hopefully we can have some time for uh, some questions uh, afterwards. Uh, but just before we get into that so really quickly, um, some of my background, I am a PhD candidate in computational media design at the University of Calgary, where I spend my time doing uh, game art and design research. Uh, and so what we'll be looking at today is um, the motivations and inspirations that uh, drove my, my desire to explore this whole idea of bringing uh, graph databases and uh, game engines together uh, and and allowing them to work together uh, for uh, non-player characters. Uh, then I will take you into a demo of one of the very first um, uh, implementations that we did, a very first experiment where we tracked uh, player movement and recorded that to to the database and then uh, allowed a non-player character to mi mimic that movement uh, afterwards. Uh, the second demo is is a, a current project that I'm working on uh, towards my thesis. And what I'm doing is uh, using a very small 
reinforcement learning algorithm in game to allow non-player characters to learn something about their environment and then storing the results of, of that learning in the graph database uh, for uh, future reference or graph ml or, or those sorts of things and then finally the third demo is is a uh, future work that we're currently working on in the lindsay virtual human lab uh, uh, that is looking at um, creating a real-time agent-based simulation of a eukaryote cell uh, and looking at the, the complex pathways and, and behaviors and uh, connecting out to a graph database to help provide uh, some of the context for what we might be looking at in a, a particular cell. And in one thing, sort of a nerdy technical thing, we're, we're looking at the uh, GLTF uh, format for loading in um, real-time um, uh, meshes and textures and animations for objects from uh, from the database. So uh, we'll we'll take a look at that, and then uh, I'll do some big hand wavy conclusions, and we'll we'll get into the uh, into the uh, comments uh, or the questions. Uh, I can see them here, so. Please feel free to throw your your, your questions into the um, into the the comment section, the the, the chat area, uh, and we'll we'll get into it. So motivations. Um, I love games. Games are are pretty incredible, uh, especially today where we're starting to see large open world games and even talk about uh, potential metaverses. Uh, and one of the things that has always uh, been important to me is uh, the uh, non-player characters in the background. And, and it's uh, a phenomenon that we're starting to see more and more of in, uh, in these open world games where players will actually go into a game and they'll just watch the non-player characters going about their day. Uh, and in this example, we have um, in the background here, you see uh, a screenshot from a game called Red Dead Redemption. And, uh, and this YouTube video that this screenshot's referencing is uh, a, a game critic reviewer who, uh, who talks about his, uh, his sort of joy of being able to go into the game and, and just observe what happens in the world. And he makes this wonderful comment that uh, NPCs make the game feel less like a beautiful painting and more like a real place. And, and that's something that resonates for me uh, very deeply. Uh, and Hollywood's in it too. Uh, uh, we, we saw a recent uh, film from Ryan Reynolds uh, called Free Guy, where uh, we have a non-player character in a game suddenly becomes sentient and uh, and decides he wants to uh, have his own his own way with things and and so starts making decisions that are outside what the the game expectations are uh, and starts building relationships with people uh, and and those sorts of things as well uh, an influence uh, on the other side of things is is i started to as i was working on this notion of, of non-player characters um is i started to think about what are the different modes that we 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 think in uh and uh, i oftentimes uh, we have our real-time mode and we have our uh speculation, reflection, uh, after action mode. And there's a wonderful book by Jeff Hawkins, who also happened to uh, invent and, and uh, created the, uh, the Palm Pilot. So that's pretty wild. Um, he is a neuroscientist who looks at um, two modes of, of thinking um, uh, in, in terms of his, his thesis there is uh, he's looking at the neocortex and all of its capabilities. And he's noticed in the research that uh, the neocortex is like a thousand small brains that uh, tackle an idea. And they all sort of populate uh, the, the, the potential solutions or the idea further. Um, and it's through this filtering uh, that that it actually leads to an actual executive action. 
Um, yeah, I love my Palm Pilot too. Uh, and, um, and so that helped inspire some of the, uh, the thinking I had about the relationship between the real time environment where my non-player character AI would be doing certain, um, processing and certain actions. And then I would have the, uh, the server-based, uh, graph database could also uh, serve a purpose and, and offer long-term memory, could offer uh, potentially some thinking capabilities. And, uh, and that really started to lead to um, this notion of, of something that I, I call um, non-deterministic behavior. Um, now, in the world of, of random behavior and uh, completely scripted or, or deterministic behavior in non-player characters, um, I wanted to find something in the middle that was, uh, and I co-opted a term called non-deterministic for my purposes. And that is really something that finds a balance between uh, a random action and a completely sort of predicted Truman Show loop type action. And, uh, and what I wanted was something that could be random or could be unexpected. But there would be some root uh, behind it and, and a reason for why it might might happen. Um, and <laughs> yeah, implement this in GTA, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and and so what I started working on, and with my uh, my collaborator Michael Waba, we we started to create uh, a uh, a blueprint solution. Uh, it, it was built using C++, and it's a plugin that allows us to have uh, bi-directional communications between the real-time environment of the game engine and the graph database sitting on a server, uh, a Neo4j graph database. And from within the game engine, we could write our, uh, our cipher queries and then pass those cipher queries out to the server receive the the response and then parse all of that uh information it, it uh, shows up as a json object uh for those of you who are familiar with json uh and and it just it allowed us to start sending and receiving data from uh from our game engine real-time environment to the uh graph database so let's take a, a look at, uh, at our first demo. So, so this first demo was uh, our attempt to connect the Neo4j and Unreal Engine in real time. It was the, uh, the proof of concept for our, um, our, uh, our plugin. And we worked through a number of iterations and, and eventually got to the place where we could uh, capture movement from the player uh, so the, the uh, player uh, moves around the space that is then stored and recorded to the Neo4j uh, database on the server. Uh, and, uh, and while all we did was just capture the, the root uh, of the, the player uh, and, and store that information, we could see the potential future potential for capturing uh, uh, all sorts of, of uh, mocap potential data um, in a in the real time environment and start to build a, um, a collaborative uh, call and response type of, of behavior between um, the uh, the players actions and the uh, the non player characters response. So let's uh, we'll, we'll flip out to uh, to uh, our first demo, very plain looking environment, but uh, it captures the, um, the, the look and feel that we're going for uh, and, and captures the functionality. So uh, what I have is I have my player character who can move around the space. And so we'll, we'll just uh, we'll move our, our player character into the starting location here. And what I can do is uh, bring up a quick user interface uh, that will allow me to record, and I'm going to just make the session ID is, is 70, it's super small, you can't see it, but, uh, but there we go, we're gonna record the player now. So when I click the run button, we're going to be sending data streamed out to uh, the, the server side of, uh, of Neo4j. Uh, and, uh, and 
we'll be able to store and record that. So here we go. We're, we're just moving around the space. Uh, and this is me using my keyboard and mouse to, to manage the, the uh, behavior of, of running around in the space. And now I'm just going to stop the recording. And what I can now do is I can choose to play back that behavior. And there's our non-player character repeating my movements and moving through the space uh, in the same way that I did uh, and mimicking my, my performance. So what's happening on the database side? Well, we'll go take a look at, uh, at Neo4j. Uh, and I have currently 100 and so let's update that to 200 nodes. Uh, oh, and I'm going to go seven. There we go. And so this is our uh, uh, our session ID. Is is this is what we captured in in the database? And let me just make this a little bigger so that we can see what's happening. And you'll see that that we simply captured the the time that the uh, that the, the we started the recording. So that's the, the time in the game uh, that we started recording. Uh, then we just simply capture uh, a time element for each one of these. We can tell uh, which what the sequence is in terms of, of previous and next. And then we actually have a, an entity node that tells us uh, who the, the entity is that we've been recording, uh, the position of the X, Y, Z of the entity, as well as a rotation. And this could be any number of variables that we want to, to capture. But in our case, we were, we were looking to, to uh, simply capture that, that, uh, that data uh, for moving around the space. So what happens is we have on the blueprint side, we have a number of, of uh, uh, blueprint uh, actions that allow us to load up the database. And, uh, and so let's just grab that real quick. Here we go. So this is the actual uh, blueprint that controls our uh, Neo4j uh, uh, connection, and we've got, uh, we have the uh, specifics of, of logging into the, the, the database, and then we can just use a query. Uh, so this is our Cypher query that is now uh, un, uh, pulling out the data, and, and then we can pass that to the uh, behavior trees for the non-player character. So that's our uh, our first demo. Now, the current work that we're doing uh, is uh, taking the same idea and applying it to uh, a, a, a number of, of um, grocery shoppers. And I, I chose the grocery shopping scenario because it's, well, first off, it's something that everybody um, oh, sorry. So uh, thank you. you. You, your question, Greg, is: uh, Am I using blueprints? Um, yes, we're, we're building. So Blueprint is the visual scripting tool for Unreal Engine. Uh, you, we can also write this code in C++ because the Unreal Engine uh, is a C++ based environment. Um, and we're communicating using Cypher and uh, JSON objects, so so we can bring that that uh, response in and uh, and work with the JSON data um, based on uh, on uh, it, the response that we get from the the servers and uh, and uh, and still work within the Blueprint environment. Um, so there you go. Uh, at the moment, uh, Jay, the logic is uh, is captured in the uh, um, it, it, the logic is captured in uh, Unreal, and we're recording the results of that that logic to Neo4j. 
Uh, and the next step in all of, uh, of this work is to start to utilize um, the data that we're able to produce from the simulation environment uh, and use GraphML uh, to do further analysis and, uh, and develop things further. For now, I'm, I'm focused on uh, how we're, we're connecting the data to, uh, to Neo4j and, uh, and looking at, at the Unreal Engine. So this next demo uh, is, is looking at a, a, a grocery shopping scenario where we have a number of non-player characters who each have their own uh, shopping list and they go about uh, moving through the, the, the space and where things become uh, uh, sort of in that, that non-deterministic mode uh, is when we get to the actual uh, shopping for the items themselves. And so uh, what I can do in this environment is, uh, is I can use some um, what I call tree ring variables, which allow me to take a single value, for example, the learning rate in, in the Q learning uh, environment and create a number of different characteristics or, or behaviors. For example, if the learning rate is low, uh, that in a behavior perspective for, for a non-player character suddenly increases their, the level of their impatience and, and their need to move quickly through their shopping list. Uh, and for those with a high learning rate, uh, that might be uh, someone who has a, a very fixed budget and must find the exact right product for the, the best value. So they're going to do a lot of comparison shopping uh, and that sort of thing. So let's, uh, we'll jump into the, uh, oh, sorry. Let me just look at uh, this one, uh, Q-learning. Um, so in terms of Q-learning, it is a, an algorithm that, uh, that allows you to uh, take a set of, uh, of possible solutions and you find your way into the best solution um, using the algorithm. And, and so what I have in, in the blueprints is I have a combination of, of the um, thinking or the training uh, ahead of time where uh, the non-player character just will think prior to taking an action. But what I discovered is, is that you can actually mimic some kind of uh, comparison shopping and, 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 you know, picking up an object and looking at it and thinking about it for a second before moving on to another object. Um, my, my characters are, are, are basically pausing in front of those objects for the moment. The animations are, are, uh, uh, I'm more focused on, on having the decision-making and the non-deterministic behavior of, of which object do you go to first? Um, which item do you comparison shop? How many comparisons do you make before you move on to your next choice? And, and by having 15, 20, 30, 50 of these non-player characters all with their own little uh, queue learning sequences running, I can generate non-deterministic, unpredictable behavior. So we, we start seeing these kinds of, of actions happening in the in the space uh, and it, it increases the the believability or, or the 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 um, this isn't the same um, pathway that every single character will follow um, in terms of, of choosing their specific objects uh, and so what we'll do is we'll jump into the demo and take a peek at it uh, so this is the uh, supermarket environment I'm just going to orient myself here to uh, where the uh, the um, shoppers will uh, show up, and then we can we have some security cameras. Um, yes, orchestrated randomness, love it. Uh, and uh, and so what I have here is is I can uh, launch my my first shopper, and they spawn and begin moving through the space. Uh, and I can add several of these shoppers. There's uh, each one of them has their own 
uh, name and and background and and credit card and uh, and uh, behaviors and characteristics. Uh, for the moment, I I'm using a single um, uh, clone of a of a non-player character um, as I I work through some of the the final details. But eventually, we will have um, different. Um, figures who are different uh, uh, body types and different ages and those sorts of things. Um, and so what I can do is I can add, uh, I'll add a couple more. Um, and now what we can do is we can start to navigate quickly around the store and we can see our shoppers looking through and moving into uh, spaces and then engaging in their their learning process. Once they've made it through their uh, their shopping list, they can then uh, move to the uh, the checkout where they despawn, where they they disappear. Um, and we'll just sort of take a quick peek around here. Yeah, there we go. So as you, we can see, there's a bit of a fight going on at the moment. We've got two characters trying to get to the same product at the same time. Oh, the drama in this thing. And so again, let's take a look at what's happening on the database side of things. So what we have in, uh, in our environment is we have these shoppers who are, I'm just going to bring this up to 100. There we go. So now what we have is, is we have our, uh, our characters who um, uh, each one of these characters has a set of, uh, hang on, stick, there we go. Uh, a set of, of properties related to um, these non-player characters, uh, and uh, ultimately these properties will drive how they, they behave, how they look, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Then each one of these characters has uh, a shopping list, and depending on which shopping list gets used, we can see that there is a small but uh, valuable uh, queue learning data uh, table that uh, captures um, the uh, both the, the the learned data. So this is in, in Q learning. This is is the sort of uh, the, the the real nuts and bolts of, of what drives the the, the decision making algorithm. Uh, and then we have our rewards table that is um, basically in this case we've got a uh, five items. So it's a five by five grid that then cycles through and, and either gives a reward, positive or negative reward for, uh, for making certain choices in that Q-learning. And, and so we can see this and, and we see this is happening on, on several of, of the, the shoppers. Uh, we have uh, different Q-learning results um, and each one of these is unique to the, uh, to the non-player character. As we have repeated experiences with this, we find ourselves uh, stepping into uh, the potential for uh, reloading the, uh, the previous learned experiences and then starting rather than uh, a blank table. Uh, we can reload that table in, in the future and use it uh, as reference for future shopping scenarios, should shopping lists that they will work through. As well, uh, the the potential is to to use if I found a particular item in uh, the dairy section, and I know that another item I haven't actually found it before, but I know that that, uh, that other item is in the dairy section. I might go to where my previous uh, found item was and start there to start looking for, you know, if I found butter, I might find cream in the dairy section, for example. So the uh, final um, uh, uh, demo that I have is a, a, a future work demo. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, an application that moves our non-player characters away from 
uh, humans and and moving into um, agents uh, or objects that we would find uh, in a, a cell. So potentially proteins or uh, um, messenger RNA, um, behaviors of, of polymerases, um, those sorts of things. And, uh, and so this is just a very early example of, of some of the work we're doing currently in the Lindsay lab. Um, and primarily what we're uh, what we're excited about is the ability to allow players to look at um, a cell at scale and then interact with those objects uh, at scale. And, uh, and as I mentioned, one of the, the things we're doing with the, um, the graph database is we are uh, using it as a potential source for uh, these GLTF, GLTF mesh objects. And so I'm just going to call it, takes a, a moment or two for it to load up. Um, but uh, I just called in a, uh, a mitochondrion. And so we'll wait for the mitochondrion to show up. Uh, there we go. And so now this mitochondrion is a GLTF uh, based, which is a JSON uh, based uh, um, texture, mesh, and animation. We don't have animations in this case, but uh, but we do have textures and meshes. And I will show you in a second uh, a, uh, where how it sits in the database. It's fairly straightforward. Um, and as well, I can, uh, I'll show you the JSON object that we're, we're uh, pulling in. It's text-based. Um, and so something that we're experimenting with is uh, we're, we're exploring, is it possible for us to build um, uh, the uh, manifold in Neo4j of these objects and then start building relationships between them uh, and having the, um, the molecules have a, a predefined relationship or how they interact with one another and, and then begin to run the simulation and, and do real-time um, uh, uh, playback of those behaviors in the environment. So what I'll, I'll do is I'll jump over real quick to our, uh, our, so in, uh, first off, let's jump into the Neo4j, uh, uh, again, very early uh, example, but uh, you'll, you'll see it immediately and uh, hopefully you'll see some potential here. Uh, so in this case, uh, like I say, we're, we're building out the structure of, of simple molecules at the moment uh, as an exploration. Uh, we're also looking, you'll see here, there's a URL that we're storing for the mitochondria. So we can query the uh, mitochondria and, uh, and have it load in. And this uh, GLTF, as I, as I mentioned, is a text-based uh, uh, object and it's quite large. The, the, that particular mitochondrion is a, is a very big file. It's a very complex file. But we were able to, to export it out of Blender and, uh, and capture its, its, uh, its text-only version. Now, that is what gets loaded. The, this text-only version is what gets loaded into uh, the Unreal Engine via Neo4j. We also have the ability to uh, embed the actual JSON mesh data into the node itself because it is just text, and we can uh, we can load that in directly from uh, Neo4j, which means that we have the potential to be able to utilize uh, Neo4j as a primary source for these objects that, that we're working with. Uh, and so coming back to Essentially, that's our, uh, our, our future work that we're working on. Um, and so some of the con conclusions that, that we have to share is, is uh, I'm really excited about real-time knowledge graphs and uh, how we can capture the behaviors and the uh, interactions between non-player characters and characters and then record those and store them and use them for future reference uh, in uh, in 
especially in open worlds where uh, you may revisit multiple uh, spaces over and over again uh, and having an ongoing history that you build with those non-player characters has incredible potential. And when we start thinking about, well, digital twins and metaverses and, and those sorts of, of uh, implementations, this kind of, of simulated non-player, simulated human in a non-player character mode also has some pretty incredible value in terms of being able to uh, run a simulation and allow those uh, those real world conditions. You know, we can model some some very interesting uh, uh, capabilities in a non-fiction scenario. Um, the uh, the last thing I wanted to point out is that the agent or the non-player character isn't just always going to be a human. We can we can look at what other entities uh, that can be explored or modeled. And so thank you. Uh, my name is Owen, and uh, thanks for hanging out and and, uh, and being with me today. Uh, I'd love to answer some questions. Uh, how do we do? I'm, I'm just going to take a second and, and review what I might have missed. Thank you, Donovan. I'm, I appreciate that you think it's exciting. Oh, give me a second here. Um, uh, my uh, my headphones, my Bluetooth disconnected on me. So just give me a second. Um, just in case you wanted to say something. Uh, <laughs> Alexander, <laughs> sneaking up behind MP NPCs will be more difficult. Uh, yep, <laughs> hopefully it'll be great if if uh, if you are particularly sneaky and a non-player character is uh, it, it gets accustomed to your sneakiness. Uh, absolutely, they should learn from that, right? Uh, are apples on sale? Well, isn't that interesting? So <laughs> uh, the. Uh, th this is a, a feature that we're, we're looking at exploring is, is while you might know where your favorite product is, um, uh, we, we want to also introduce, well, what are the interruptions? What are the things that disrupt your, uh, your, your shopping experience as a non-player character? How can, we, um, how can we interrupt that shopping experience perhaps with a sale item? And then what are the, the sort of, what are the, the tree ring variables that will allow for that kind of distraction to happen? Um, and, and what is required to make that happen? Um, so uh, desires, uh, expected outcomes, yes, they do. That's that's a big part of, of the um, the uh, learning rate as well as the what's called the discount factor in Q learning. So you're not necessarily making changes to the rewards table, although you could. Um, you, the rewards table is is kind of consistent for everyone. It's more how the individual agent interacts with that uh, environment and uh, and then depending on their um, their discount rate or their learning rate they may spend uh, they, they may end up getting many many rewards for looking at something uh, before they make a decision um, and and that might be a, a high value thing Simone are you trying to get my attention you're muted you're muted Oh my gosh, here we go. Technical difficulties. As I was talking away, Owen, I wish we could have you on here for another couple hours. Everybody loved you. Um, <laughs> so, so much. I don't know if you want to, oh, you have your email address at the bottom so people can get a hold of you. That's <laughs> fabulous. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, my, my, uh, my good friend and supervisor, Dr. Patrick Finn, is in the, in the chat. And uh, and his comment is, are you going to tell them how you've been preaching Neo4j to everyone who will listen here in Calgary? <laughs> <laughs> well, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, spreading the word about us. And remember to put your hoodie in the mail for me after we're done, right? Uh, of uh, course. Absolutely. Of course. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you again, Owen. Um, let's stay in touch. And if you guys have any further questions for him, his email is right there at the bottom. And I know he'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. Thank you again okay. for the time. Okay.